Thank you, Peter. Uh, if you look over here, it says about the Humanities Festival, serious, smart culture. I'm here to talk about sports. Do you see the problem? I'm going to do the best I can. Culture and sports at the moment may be mutually exclusive. Uh, I come to you after a week in which the biggest story in all of sports involves one 300-pound football player who is supposedly bullying and harassing another 300-pound football player. Their names are Richie Incognito and Jonathan Martin. The National Football League wishes Mr. Incognito were incognito. The part of this story is, and here's where we see the separation between the Humanities Festival and a lot of what I'm doing. Part of this story is that the young player, the younger player, Jonathan Martin, must somehow overcome his background if he is going to be a successful professional football player. What is his background? His parents went to Harvard and he went to Stanford. If he could just overcome that, he could be a regular player. A little while ago, we had a young man from Harvard who arrived in the NBA to play professional basketball. Some of you know about him. His name is Jeremy Lin. He is Asian in origin. He succeeded brilliantly. Nobody could believe it. Professional basketball is the only place where an Asian from Harvard succeeds and everybody is surprised. <laughs> the first college football game was between Princeton and Rutgers. It was in 1869. I, it saddens me to report that Rutgers won that game six to four. However, they played again the next week. This was at Princeton, and Princeton won eight to nothing. Now, 164 years later, college football has grown into a mass spectacle of public entertainment. Princeton became the Tigers. Rutgers became the Scarlet Knights of the Raritan. That's a river for those of you who are not familiar with New Jersey geography. Every school and every team adopted a totem or an identity as part of its presentation of its athletic teams. Some of them worked and some did not. We will take a look at many of them now. Some of them were downright embarrassing. There is little doubt that team totems take on a surprising uh, level of importance. USA Today, the largest circulation paper in the United States, recently conducted a best sports totem contest. Um, this happened earlier this year, and in the course of this contest, more than 80 million votes were cast, asking which was the best sports mascot. This is what we do in America. 80 million votes were cast. Barack Obama, in the last election, only got 65 million votes. He's nothing compared to a sports totem, apparently. Poor Mitt Romney only got 61, but 80 million votes are cast, and the winner of the competition was the Centralia Orphans. That's from downstate Illinois. The origin of the name Orphans, like the origin of so many of these totems, is obscure. But a Chicago sports writer once wrote about the Centralia basketball team, they looked like orphans, but they could sure play basketball. The orphans are a continuing source of pride to the town of Centralia, which is suffering very hard times. It's a town of 14,000 people with an unemployment rate of 13%. Although there is some evidence that some people voted early and often in this poll, uh, the number of votes cast is on a, in a best mascot, a best totem contest, is a measure of the importance of these team names. Not all the names are as wholesome as the Centralia Orphans. We have names like the Lord Jeffs of Amherst College, the great liberal arts school in the East. The, the name comes from Lord Jeffrey Amherst. 
He is the guy who gave Indians blankets that were infected with smallpox. They now call themselves the Lord Jeffs. They have no plans to change that. We have also had names that were plainly and simply racist. We had in here in this state, in Pekin, Illinois, it's down there by Peoria, we had for a long time the Pekin Chinks. Can you believe this? They became the Dragons in 1980. In South Africa, there was a very important soccer team that for a long time used the name the Dangerous Darkies. Now we have the Washington Redskins. Redskins is a racist epithet. Its origin was that for a period of time in this country, if you brought in the skin or a scalp of a Native American, you were paid a bounty. It could be a child, it could be a woman, it could be anybody who was a Native American. That is the origin of the term Redskins. President Obama has now finally intervened. He has suggested that the team really ought to reconsider its name. The owner, however, remains adamant. He wants to keep the name Redskins. He has a huge sum of money invested in that brand. There may actually be a change in this name, Washington Redskins. Washington is so unpopular now that he may change it to the Maryland Redskins. <laughs> Other names and other totems are a lot more fun. At Brooklyn College, they have sports teams. Guess what they call them? The Bridges, as in the Brooklyn Bridges. On the more exotic level, we have the Webster University Gorlocks, the St. Louis College of Pharmacy Eutectic, and a high school that calls its teams the, Ob the Obazags. The Gorlock is a mythical beast invented in a school contest that combines the paws of a speeding cheetah, the horns of a fierce buffalo, and the face of a dependable Saint Bernard. The, the Eutectics are named, I forgot to give you the redskins here, don't let the logo fool you, it is a racist uh, epithet. The, the Eutectics are named for a metal alloy with the lowest melting point why that would be the name remains a mystery. The word obazag, incredibly, is an anagram from the word gazebo, and at that school, a gazebo was a central attraction. Why high school kids are doing anagrams on the word gazebo remains unknown. At Eastern New Mexico University, they use an exotic and a most interesting name for the women's teams, the Zias, Z-I-A-S. The Zia is an ancient Indian sun symbol that views the number four as sacred and encourages personal growth in four directions, a strong body, a clear mind, a pure spirit, and a devotion to the welfare of other people, a surprisingly wholesome name for those teams. The, the use of color is surprisingly popular in team names. Uh, as Peter mentioned, on the south side at the University of Chicago, we have the Maroons. I also found two high school teams who have adopted the Maroons as their totem. There is, of course, the Harvard Crimson. Harvard, for those of you who are not familiar, is a school in the East. <laughs> those of us who are University of Chicago people acknowledge that school every now and then. I just did it for the first time in about 10 years. Um, there are also at least two colleges known as the Big Red, another one known as the Big Green. There is the Stanford Cardinal, which is named for a shade of red, not for the bird. And at Carnegie Mellon, in Pittsburgh, a wonderful school, when they could not agree on a single color, they adopted the term tartans for their teams. Those tartans are playing those maroons right now on the south side in Stag Field as we are gathered here. Then we have college teams that take the color idea one step further. They are known as the Green Wave, the Green Terror, the Mean Green, the blue streak, the golden flash, the red flash, the crimson wave, and most famously, the crimson tide. They have been around for so long, we don't even notice the grammatical error in the hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, not leaves, the Toronto Maple Leafs. The use of the improper plural does not appear to have bothered the people of Toronto. They have sold out the building for every game since 1957, one of the most enduring records in all of sports. At some high schools, they are not 
afraid of venturing into the grammatical thicket of gerunds. Those of you who are English majors may appreciate this. We have the Mount Clemens battling bathers. They happen to be on a pond. We have the Effingham Flaming Hearts downstate here in Illinois, and we have the Mars area fighting planets to show how gerunds can become part of these names. In addition to teams that use color in their names, we have teams that rely on the weather for their origins. There are at least four teams known as the Tornadoes, another one called the Golden Tornadoes, three teams known as Cyclones, and two more took the name Hurricanes. There is even a college that calls itself the Golden Hurricanes. We are faced with the fact that in the United States, we have institutions of higher learning that chose to call their teams the Golden Tornadoes and the Golden Hurricanes. This is not all of the weather teams. We have three teams known as the Red Storm. We have a Crimson Storm. We have a Purple Storm. Two, uh, two other schools are just plain Storm. And then, incredibly, there's a school that uses the name Savage Storm. Please note that we have not yet even mentioned Thunder and Lightning. Both are used as names. Wheaton College, the evangelical school west of us here, calls its teams the Thunder. At SUNY Lehman, that City University of New York Lehman, they call their teams the Lightning. If Wheaton College were to venture to New York City to play SUNY, it would be the Thunder against the Lightning in a soccer game. Before we go into some of the larger categories of team names and team totems, there are several that seem to come from absolutely nowhere. They include the Mighty Oaks, the Blue Hose. The Blue Hose, that's a Presbyterian school. Probably they should have called it the Blue Nose. It would have been more accurate. We have in Alaska a team, that, a university that calls its teams the Nanooks, as in Nanook of the North. Um, we have the Cotton Blossoms, we have the Purple Aces in Evansville, we have the Little Giants of Wabash College, we have the Purple Pounders of Chattanooga Central High School. Purple Pounders, what are they talking The people at these schools not only love these names, they would fight you if you tried to suggest a change. We even have names, na we even have teams that are named for socks and shoes. We all know about the White Sox and the Red Sox, Tutopolis High School, is the home of the wooden shoes, and there are, of course, the aforementioned blue hose. The best one of these off-the-wall names may have come from the Rhode Island School of Design. Somebody persuaded, see if you see this one coming, somebody persuaded the school to call its team the NADS, N-A-D-S, the NADS. Someone there at the school was not paying close attention when they made this decision. The NADs, think about it, Northwestern people respond when you're talking to them with the phrase, go cats. At this school, it became, go NADs. Sorry about that, I couldn't resist. Royalty is interesting to some schools and is used in their totems. We have the Dukes, the Barons, the Grenadiers, the Kings, the Kingsmen, the Regals, and four teams named the Royals. The most surprising is the Baptist College in Texas that calls its teams the Flying Queens. Imagine how the men's basketball players feel when they are called the Flying Queens. From the public, public governmental sector, we have teams named the governors, the judges, the senators, the diplomats, the statesmen, the colonels, the captains, and from Cardozo College, teams known as the clerks. Another fine name. It's one thing to be a clerk on the United States Supreme Court. It's another thing to call your soccer and lacrosse teams the clerks. Looking at jobs in the private sector, teams are named for pilots, threshers, and one of my favorites, the anchormen. Think Ted Baxter, <laughs> the anchormen. The college is in Rhode Island, and it may well be a nautical reference. But if you see Ron Majors, tell him he can get an honorary degree at this school by just showing up. There are also teams that use foods as their mascots. At Scottsdale Community College in Arizona, it's the flying artichokes. At Frankfurt High School, of course, they're called the hot dogs. And as many of you know, here at Freeport, Illinois, the teams are called the pretzels. It is no surprise that religious schools 
use religious names for their teams, but some of the names can be surprising. Some of you may be familiar with the demon deacons of Wake Forest. It's right here in front of me. Why do I turn around to look? I'm not sure. Um, we also have teams known as the preachers, the missionaries, the parsons, and the praying colonels. There is one school that calls its men's teams the preachers and the women's teams the angels. There's yet another one that is the home of the avenging angels. If they scheduled a game against DePaul University, it would be the avenging angels against the blue demons. That would be worth seeing. My favorite in this category are two teams known as the battling bishops. Both are Methodist schools with the name Wesleyan uh, in their names. Judy, who is here, my wife, and I are members of a Methodist church, the Chicago Temple. There's a couple others from our church here. And knowing what we know about the Methodist church, battling bishops is a great name. <laughs> we should also note here that Northwestern University teams were first called the Fighting Methodists and did not become the Wildcats until 1924. We find some more religious names uh, in the category of angels and devils. When it comes to sports teams, the devils are way ahead of the angels. There are no less than six teams known as the Blue Devils, as well as our own Blue Demons at DePaul. There are also two named Red Devils, and two others named Devils and Demons. And then, of course, we have the Arizona State Sun Devils. Whoops. That would be it. OK. Um, the Against this array of evil, we have the previously named Avenging Angels and two teams called the Blue Angels. While we are looking at evil in team names, we should also consider a few more. There was a high school in Yuma, Arizona that was once housed in a former penitentiary, and they actually called their teams the Criminals. The University of Idaho calls its teams the Vandals, and there's another school, a maritime school, that calls its teams the keel haulers in honor of a maritime form of punishment that is both cruel uh, and unusual. Even with those preachers and devils and angels, the largest category of teams based on human endeavor is the Knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S. No less than 36 colleges and universities are using Knights as their totem. Six are called the Golden Knights, we have two sets of Scarlet Knights, Purple Knights, Green Knights, and Blue Knights. We even have a team called the Urban Knights. The most famous knights in all of sports are the Black Knights of West Point, the United States Military Academy. Other popular teams in the Human Endeavor category are the Pioneers, with 27 different schools using that name, the Crusaders, with 21. The large number of Crusaders is a bit of a surprise. The Crusaders of the Middle Ages were consisted of campaigns by a militaristic church that resulted in massacres of Jews and Arabs. In the last several years, the term Crusaders has become less than politically correct. But many schools persist in using the name, even as some have changed the names to something more appropriate. Wheaton College was the Crusaders and became the Thunder. Um, in the town of Thermal, California, next week, the Board of Education will be reconsidering its use of the totem Arabs for the sports teams of its high school. A group of Amer Arab Americans had objected to the team mascot, a hook-nosed, snarling Arab with one gold tooth. The Arab American group does not want to eliminate the name. It wants a more reasonable caricature of an Arab to be used. Other popular names in this category are Saints with 19, Vikings with 16 teams, and Patriots with eight. Before we leave the human endeavor category, let's take a quick look at the use of Native American names for uh, our teams. We have already mentioned the, uses, the use of the racist epithet Redskins for the National Football League in our nation's capital. There are 40 colleges and universities that use Indian references for their teams. 25 schools use the term warriors for their teams. Warriors is a word that could mean 
different things, but when you look at most of these schools, the logos and the caricatures they use are always Native Americans. The, the, we have six schools who use the term Braves, along with the Atlanta Braves, four who use Indians, along with the Cleveland Indians, and we also have the Red Men, the Chippewa, one team known as the Tribe, and two others known as the Renegades and the Seminoles. One of the most notorious examples of the use of Native American terms for a sports team was the University of North Dakota, which called its teams the Fighting Sioux, as in the Sioux Indian tribe. When the tribe began to object to the use of the name, a booster of the school's hockey team donated $40 million to build in a hurry a new hockey rink in which the phrase Fighting Sioux was literally etched in stone, in marble, on the floor, in the bathrooms, all through the building. The totem literally was etched in stone. The issue grew in intensity in North Dakota and finally resulted recently in a statewide election. They, the people of North Dakota were asked to vote yes or no on the use of the term Fighting Sioux. They voted no overwhelmingly in support of the Indian tribe and against the fans of the Fighting Sioux. The anger over this dispute has been so intense that at this university they're not going to have any name at all for three years in a kind of a cooling off period before they figure out how to offend somebody else. <laughs> the NCAA, the beleaguered body that administers college sports, uh, is now pushing all schools that use Indian names to eliminate them as soon as possible. It is a process that's underway. It's encouraging to see, but it will take several years to complete. A few words now about our local heroes, the Chicago Blackhawks. They are not to be confused in any way with the offensive Redskins. The man who founded the team in 1926 was a guy named Frederick McLaughlin. He had served in World War I in the 86th Infantry Division of the Black Hawk Division. He survived the war. He loved his unit. When he founded the hockey team, he decided to name it after his military unit. That unit was named in honor of a Sauk tribe chief by the name of Black Hawk, two words, uh, who had distinguished himself in numerous battles particularly in the War of 1812. McLaughlin named the team in honor of both the military unit and the chief. There is a statue of Blackhawk downstate here near Ottawa. Uh, the sculptor was Laredo Taft, the great artist of the University of Chicago. In a major effort to separate his team from the Redskins, John McDonough, the brilliant leader of the Chicago Blackhawks, has aggressively promoted the legend of Chief Black Hawk and the history of how this team was named. He is even using a, a large sum of money to make sure that the statue of Chief Black Hawk is restored and rehabilitated. It had fallen into some disrepair. Uh, the use of animals uh, and birds as team mascots has been considerably less controversial than the use of Native American images. More teams use animals and birds as mascots than all the previous categories that we have discussed. First, let's consider two mascots that with the exception of Washington's use of the epithet Redskins are easily the two ugliest in all of sports. First and foremost is the javelina. Look at this. The javelina, which is also known as a peccary, as you can see, is a member of the pig family. It enjoys all the prime characteristics of the pig, but none of its attractive attributes. It has a pig snout, small beady eyes, and a misshapen head that makes it look prehistoric. It can be three to four feet long and weigh as much as 90 pounds. In some descriptions, it is known literally as the skunk pig. It is unclear why anybody would select this animal as a mascot, but the people on the campus of Texas A&M at Kingsville, that's the school that uses this, they understand the problem with their mascot. They never show a picture, they have no caricature, they just write 
javelinas on the jerseys and on the side of the helmets. They realize nobody really wants to see a javelina. The second ugliest mascot or totem is the griffin, a kind of gargoyle creature that combines the head and wings uh, of an eagle and the body, hind legs, and the tail of a lion. You see it frequently in ancient cathedrals as you travel through Europe. It's a nice combination in theory, but looks good only on those cathedrals. Four schools have adopted the griffin as their mascot. One of them, Sarah Lawrence College, the alma mater, by the way, of our mayor, Rahm Emanuel, has, uses the griffin, but it spells it G-R-Y-P-H-O-N. They apparently wanted to be, not only have an ugly mascot, they wanted to be pretentious, pre pretentious and pedantic about it. Uh, at Canisius University, they actually call it the Golden Griffins. Golden maybe, but still ugly. The Banana Slug, the mascot of the University of California, Santa Cruz, is a finalist in the ugly contest, but the students at this wonderful campus selected the Banana Slug as a kind of a parody on team mascots. Some animals were simply invented for the sole purpose of serving as team mascots, we have the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League, the Odessa Jackalopes in Texas, the Port Huron Border Cats in Michigan, and the Grand Prairie Air Hogs, all of these pure inventions. The most popular animal totem in all of sports is the tiger. Thank you, Peter. He showed that the, the, uh, at least 50 colleges and professional sports teams call themselves the Tigers. There are two sets of golden tigers and one set, for some reason, of maroon tigers. The next most popular mascot is the bulldog, with 40 teams followed by 33 sets of wildcats, 33 sets of lions, 31 sets of bears, and 25 sets of cougars. In the bears category, we have five golden bears, we have brown bears, we have blue bears, we have battling bears, and we have black bears. We even have two teams known as the Grizzlies and four, four more known as the Bruins. It should be noted, in all of sports, there is only one team known as the Cubs. Even as a Cub fan all of my life, I must admit that there are many good reasons for having only one team known as the Cubs. There are also a number of teams named after dogs. My two favorites are the Whippets of Lake Wobegon and the Bloodhounds, I love this one, of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the Bloodhounds. It's perfect. It's just as good as the Brooklyn Bridges. They, they, we also include in this category three teams of Greyhounds, three sets of Huskies, a couple sets of Terriers, and one team of Scotties. Uh, the other large category, of totems is birds. Our survey of college and professional teams found 73 that use the eagle as their totem. It is not a total surprise that this symbol of America would be used so often in an industry that uses patriotism as part of its marketing and part of its presentations. Our national anthem is sung more at sports events than it is sung anywhere else. There are large numbers of Americans, I believe, who, who think that the last two words of the national anthem are play ball. <laughs> Our group of Eagle teams includes 13 who call themselves the Golden Eagles, as in the one you see, two Screaming Eagles, and we also have Bald Eagles, Soaring Eagles, Purple Eagles, and Crimson Eagles. In addition to the 73 teams in the bird category, we have 45 teams that call themselves the Hawks. There are 12 different kinds of hawks on this list, including seven sets of red hawks, four sky hawks, and three night hawks. Night hawk has nothing to do with the great Edward Hopper painting. It's just a name they made up. We also have nearly two dozen teams that use falcons as their totem, making the birds the largest of these categories. It is a bit of a surprise to me to learn, as I did this, that we have insects also that have become team totems. We have no less than 15 teams who call themselves the Yellow Jackets, and we have another 12 that are the Hornets. Uh, in addition to the issues that result from the use of Native American images, sports teams 
have faced occasional difficulty with their totems as women's teams came along. Uh, as most of you know, women's teams came along as the result of a passage of a federal law known as Title IX. You remember Title IX. It was legislation written and acted and enacted into law by Richard Nixon, that noted social engineer, that requires all institutions of higher learning to provide equal sports opportunities uh, for women and for men. It has transformed the world of college sports and has produced some very interesting team totems. At Central State University in Ohio, the teams had been called the Marauders. Now the women's teams are called the Lady Marauders. A school that used Chanticleers for its totem faced a problem. A Chanticleer is a rooster. They came up with the Lady Chants for the women's names because they knew Lady Roosters was not going to work. At a school that used Thoroughbreds for its men's teams, they invented the phrase Thoroughbreds, ending in E-T-T-E-S, very clever. A school that called its teams the Blue Boys now calls its women's teams the Lady Blues. At Kenyon College, the Lords were joined by the Ladies, and at Centenary College in Louisiana, the Gents were joined also by the Ladies. What we have seen today are the highlights of team totems selected from among 1,548 college teams, 120 professional teams, and a number of high school teams. What do we see when we look at these totems? What do we know? Here is what I see and what I know. As counterintuitive and as wacky as it may seem, people are serious about these things. When I was in high school at Glenbard West, the teams were, as Peter mentioned, known as the Hilltoppers. A group of smart guys a couple years ahead of me thought Hilltoppers was a ridiculous name. They wanted to become the Wildcats and be a real sports program. That was their idea. Their effort was an abysmal failure. Otherwise, apathetic students fought to preserve the name Hilltoppers. The school is located on a spectacular setting on a hill overlooking a lake. Hilltoppers was and is just right. I am not the most enthusiastic alumnus of Princeton University, but if someone tried to change the name of Princeton's teams to something other than Tigers, I would be unhappy and I would immediately join anyone objecting to the change. A number of years ago, Princeton decided to go co-educational, admitting women into the university. It prompted a protest by a group of alumni who got organized and started their own magazine and tried to engineer a protest. The judge on the Supreme Court, Samuel Alito, was part of that protest. If they tried to switch away from Tigers, it would make the protest on co-education look benign, would be my expectation. We have somehow elevated sports uh, into a central element of our culture. We do not build cathedrals, we build stadiums. In Detroit, a city in bankruptcy, they are building a hockey arena with nearly $300 million in public funds, taxpayer money. The highest paid people in our colleges and universities are the football and basketball coaches. The average salary of a professional baseball player is more than $3 million. A family of four now spends $500 to attend a major league baseball games. Football players are victims of concussion violence on the field and then perpetrate their own kinds of violence off the field. We know as we look at this industry that something is askew. We know that there is something that is not quite right. But when the games begin, we love and we support our teams. We support our Bears, we support our Cubs, our White Sox, our Bulls, and our Blackhawks. And we love our totems. Go Bears. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. We have two microphones. Please raise your hand. We'll do our best to get the microphones to you and move around the room. So I'm going to start right here. 
Yeah, I have a quick observation and a question. The observation is you didn't mention the apple knockers from downstate Illinois. <laughs> I thought about them. <laughs> what category would I put them in? Probably they were they just made up the table, but that's Fruit a great and violence, name. violence, I guess. What is it, Cobden apple knockers? Yes. Yeah. Um, my question is, even if Mr. Snyder decides to keep the name Redskins, the racist term, why does the media feel compelled to constantly use that rather than just referring to the Washington football team? That, that is an excellent question. Why do we in the media persist in joining the ownership of the Redskins and using the epithet in our coverage? Uh, we have debated that at ESPN. ESPN, as a large organization, has a huge financial connection to the National Football League. The debate at ESPN ended that we have to consider our commitment to Monday Night Football, the biggest profit center that we have, and somehow we made the decision that we would stick with the Redskins. Other publications, Sports Illustrated, New York Times, Sporting News, Yahoo Sports, some of these could make that decision. I suspect it will come. The, the fact that President Obama expressed himself on this is extremely important. This thing had been kicking around. It had been in court. It had been before the Federal Trade Commission. It had been in numerous venues seeking relief. And now finally, thanks to President Obama intervening, I think something may yet happen. Daniel Snyder is beginning to realize that maybe this is not going to work. And he'll, he'll have to decide on a transition and do it over a period of years. But I think it may happen. I'm, I'm encouraged primarily because Obama spoke out on it. Here you have it. Oh, yeah. If you were Lance Armstrong's attorney, uh, balancing the morality and your responsibility as his attorney, what would you advise them to do? Keep his mouth shut or spill it, spill it and open all the cans of worms that he has? If I were Lance Armstrong's attorney, I would be extremely happy. He is being sued 21 times. This lawyer has more work than he ever dreamed of having. Um, the, the morality and the legal work sometimes do not fit together very well. I think Armstrong made an interesting decision when he decided to try to come clean with Oprah Winfrey. Poor Judy had to sit as I watched those interviews for four hours. Um, but th they are, from what I know, and I looked into this a few weeks ago, Armstrong's lawyers and Armstrong are looking for ways to settle with everybody who has a claim against him. He collected a lot of money winning the Tour de France under the premise that he was drug free. There were bonuses, millions of dollars in bonuses that he collected. Um, he's going to have to pay those back. He's trying to do it. So I would say that the lawyers and his management have reached the conclusion they cannot defend the lie any longer, and they're doing what they can. So I, I'm, I'm perhaps more hopeful than most, most other media types on this, but I think he is on the path to attempting to do the right thing. But we'll see. We'll see as these cases move along. I have a question. Oh, here, you got the mic. I was a big fan of your sports writers on TV. Oh. Could you share some of the stories of your colleagues and how that whole group got together? Uh, the it question is about uh, a television show called uh, Sports Writers on TV. Uh, the stars of the show were Bill Gleason, Bill Jouse, Ben Bentley, Rick Tellender. I was on the show in the final years. Uh, it was one of the great joys of my life. There's no question about it. You could never have greater conversations. The, the, we would tape the show once a week. It was seven segments of seven minutes in length. And so we had to have seven topics to argue about. And we would come early to try to reach a consensus on the seven topics. We should have taped that discussion. It was hysterical. I was laughing so hard so often that frequently my topics never got on the show. And I had great topics. But uh, Gleason and Jouse are no longer with us. Tellender continues to write uh, for the Sun-Times. 
Uh, it was just a wonderful show to be involved in. Um, it, it, it's not a big surprise to me that you mention it. It happens to Judy and me uh, frequently. Uh, I thought we had sort of a cult following of about 11 people, but now you're 12 here, so <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that you asked that question. Who's got the microphone? You can make that 13 followers. I really enjoyed the sports reporters as well. Thank you. Um, just a question about your, your general impression of the debate down in Champaign, um, the specificity of using Chief Alinawek. Um, and I'm not an Illinois alum, I've not followed it very closely, but I found it interesting that there's a lot of specificity regarding the, the Chief Alinawek mascot and the, the term fighting Illini. Um, and just is it, is it splitting hairs? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts? The, the Chief Alinawek controversy was obviously a controversy over the major totem of the entire university athletic program. It went on for years. It started as a kind of a quiet protest. It worked its way all the way up to the board of trustees of the university. Um, I think the best writing on this uh, came from Roger Ebert, uh, a graduate of the University of Illinois. He grew up in Urbana, although he couldn't tell the difference between a linebacker and a shortstop. He clearly had a feel for how important the Illini Wick and the Fighting Illini totems were to the alumni and to the students. It was very difficult for them to dispose of Chief Illini Wick. Uh, I think there remains a remnant of Illini Wick performing somewhere, but it, was, it just shows you the strength and the intensity of the loyalty that people have to these totems. It, it, I, I've been thinking about it a lot wor working on this presentation. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I like tigers at Princeton because I like tigers at Princeton. There's some sort of tautology in there. Uh, it's not you know, the best intellectual position to be in, but that seems to be the way it works. And when somebody tries to change one of these things, uh, it's a very traumatic event. Right now at Fresno State University, they are the bulldogs and a gang, a street gang of enormous proportion has adopted bulldog as its own logo. So these gangbangers are going around with the university logo tattooed on their bodies. There are murders and violence and all sorts of things and the university may have to eliminate bulldogs, something they've had for 80 years, from their world. So it's a, and it's going to be very traumatic for them. It's going to be very traumatic. Yes. Oh, Cam. Lester, uh, you haven't found uh, or you haven't mentioned any prehistoric totems. Shouldn't we have the Chicago T-Rexes? <laughs> <laughs> We've got the guy who purchased the T-Rex. You should ask John. The, um, the, the only totems that came close to being prehistoric, uh, for some reason, Schools and professional teams have fallen in love with the word predators. That's about as far back uh, as anybody has gone. There was a team called the Mastodons. I forget where they're from, where Oklahoma, the Mastodons, because a major Mastodon was discovered on the campus, and so they named the team uh, the Mastodons. But that, that, there's a whole new market here opening up for teams. It, it, it's a good idea. Hello. Oh, there you are, okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, voice and share some of the information that I know. I am a full-blood Native American, um, and dealing with the Chicago Blackhawks logo and the Red and the Redskins Washington logo, um, there is a problem with them. Although the Blackhawks logo, it it is a nice picture, and they are now finally taking the time to learn about our culture and our cultural practices today, and they are supporting the American Indian Center here. Um, there is a big debate about it within Native country. The Red Kings logo, the, I think it's the name that is more offensive than the actual photo or the actual yeah. art with. Yeah. And from what I've learned is that the Red Kings chose that name, and it was based upon uh, the fact that there was a bounty put on red skin, on native people, to bring in their scouts. And that's how they adopted the name of red skin. So seeing it from that point of view, no, I do not like the name red skin. And that that owner does need to take some time to realize that we are native people, we practice our cultures, 
um, the American Community Center was um, in the debate with Chief Alignment and how he portrayed himself as dancing around. He did have authentic Native American outfits, regalia. We don't call them costumes because we are Native. We, these are our artifacts that we wear when we dance and, and practice our culture. So he, would, he more or less made a mockery of it. And that's what we don't like. We don't like when they're portraying it as that way. And if they would learn about our culture and our practices, that would make a big difference. The, uh, as you say, Redskins is clearly racist, clearly epithet. The, the, uh, the logo, the logo for the Redskins is benign. It's not the logo that anybody objects to, it's the term Redskins. It is, it is, it is like other epithets, Polak, the N-word, all the other things that we have, that, that uh, we seek to remove from our colloquy. The uh, Black Hawk, as a chief, as an individual, is a distinguishable situation from the Redskins. Redskins, there's no rationale to preserve the name Redskins other than the money that is involved in, in the brand that they have developed. Okay. Well. Uh, Mr. Munson, you mentioned Title IX in your remarks. I was in the first class of women at Princeton, and <laughs> I appreciate that women now have the opportunity to play, but if we look at media, uh, sports pages, sports coverage on TV or radio, it's still predominantly male, that except for someone like Serena Williams winning a tennis tournament, women are rarely featured in the headlines in the sports section of the paper. How do you think that can be changed? Uh, that is a really good question. You're 100% correct. I wouldn't say it's predominantly male in the sport page and at ESPN. It's like 99%. There's no question about it. Not only do we in sports media not offer reasonable coverage to particularly women's team sports, um, in a lot of sports talk shows, on radio stations that we have and that other organizations have, there is a, a level of scorn and ridicule for women's team sports that we must eliminate. And there is certainly, the management of ESPN is attempting to eliminate that. But a, as an example of what you're saying, the, we have a women's professional basketball team here, the Chicago Sky. At the moment, they are a really interesting team. They have a couple of young players who are gonna be big stars. And you would have, I'm sure the ratio of coverage between the Bulls and the Sky is five or 600 to one. There's, there's, that's, there's nothing remotely resembling parity and certainly the coverage. You, you could do them both. There's now, given the different platforms we have to report on sports, there's no excuse for not, that it's not a space problem. They just don't want to do it. So it's, it remains, this has gone on for a long time. And, and I don't expect it to change radically, but it will improve. Sports Illustrated, where I worked, we, there was a serious problem covering women's sports. The, if you were on the staff of Sports Illustrated during the years I was there, and now as well, and you were assigned to the women's golf tour, you knew that your career was not going well. It was like a signal that you should prepare your resume because you are not going to move up. So, th so there, th you're identifying. Yeah, what's your uh, take on the incognito Miami Dolphin uh, <laughs> fiasco? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's a thoroughly embarrassing thing for the National Football League. The, the fact that this young man uh, was driven from the team by the guy who was supposed to be the leader of his unit. Both play offensive line. On any NFL team, there are eight or nine offensive linemen. They work out together, they practice together. Um, they try to form a unit. Right now on the Chicago Bears, for example, the offensive line has some young guys who are actually playing very well. Somehow this coach has 
managed to produce a decent offensive line for the first time in a long time. But the leader, uh, the leader of the Miami Dolphins team is an incognito, a questionable guy before they signed him. As one indication of the way he conducts himself, he had the meetings of the offensive line unit at a strip club in Miami Beach. That was his idea of how to conduct the unit. The, what will the outcome of this be? I'm, I think the outcome probably will be that neither one of them is going to be back in the National Football League. I would be shocked if anybody signed incognito, the older. The younger guy has to decide whether he wants to play, and if he wants to play, he's gonna have to go somewhere other than Miami. And in the meantime, the league is working on rules and guidelines for hazing, for bullying, and for harassing of fellow teammates, they're gonna to have to put it all in writing, which it has never been before. I expect that to happen uh, rather quickly. They've hired outside lawyers to do all this work. We have time for maybe just one more short question. Then go right here. Are you familiar with the term Chinese bandits at LSU? I think the term Chinese bandits was for the defense, wasn't it? The, the, exactly. The, Back uh, in the 50s and 60s, because the coach said there's nothing as mean as a Chinese bandit, so he wanted his players to be mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure he'd want, if the coach, who, who's the coach now, Les Miles? I don't think he would want to use that term now. Uh, they'll stick with tigers. You can stay out of trouble using tigers at LSU. The, some of the designations for these subunits can be quite embarrassing, and uh, but yeah, Chinese bandits, that was a famous defense. But you have to be a certain age to know about the Chinese, we, a few people like that here. Thank you very much.